Hey, what's up, Cosmetic family? Thanks for joining us on the Cosmetic Podcast. Cosmetic means being a person, a thing that gives rise to a phenomenon that is dynamic or energizing. We're tackling topics and telling the truth. Hey, I'm Keith Vincent. And I'm Rodrigo Ross. Hey, so today we have the incredible CEO of Communities and School for the Dallas region, Mr. Adam Powell. Woo-hoo! <laughs> yes, Thank indeed. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. So, for those of you who, who all don't know what the Communities in School is all about, they're they're the link of that community base of resources with the highs of the high. Uh, at risk of uh, children and so they're touching uh, young people from all across the area we've got 10 school districts that they represent uh, from the Dallas Plano Richardson Carrollton Farmers uh, Branch area and also McKinney uh, so tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing and the impact that you all are making yeah at communities and schools what we're essentially doing is is removing all of the structural impediments uh, to academic success. Right? Mm. If you look at all the literature and what it suggests uh, around academics is that so many students that are underperforming academically, it's usually for non-academic reasons. Right? right. You think homelessness, you think students that are in foster care and just dealing with a, with a, a litany of issues. Um, and mental health is, is chief among those now, uh, particularly on the heels of COVID. So we're working uh, across uh, actually 16 school districts now. We've added several in the, in the last few weeks. Oh, man. Uh, mm. in, in 150 schools. Uh, we've got full-time staff on those campuses that are working uh, every day to put together really individualized plans for all of the uh, at-risk students on those campuses. Mm. Yeah, so mm. so let's talk about that because that has absolutely been um, interwoven into so many conversations across so many yep. different industries and strata and all kinds of stuff, which hence the name of our podcast today, Peace of Mind. Um, <laughs> right? So Hello. talk to us about um, th- this this what you guys are doing and how you are centering being intentional about helping these young folks through some of the mental wellness and the mental health challenges that absolutely I agree with you 100% were exacerbated by the pandemic. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, so we're 36 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for years we've worked uh, kind of in these spaces, although uh, in some cases we haven't necessarily been as explicit about the, the specific work that we're doing. Right. And what we saw four or five years ago was just this slight uptick um, in, in mental health challenges right and right a couple of years ago i would say that that uptick probably transitioned to this kind of gargantuan increase to a point where now roughly half of the students that we serve and we're talking thousands of students wow. that, right. uh, identify as having some kind of mental health challenge right so what we've essentially done and and, and felt like it was incumbent upon us as a nonprofit, uh is really start to build what we call our clinical team yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So we have a clinical team on staff of licensed professionals uh, overseen by a licensed professional counselor that are wow. spending their time working directly with our site coordinators, working directly with students, uh, families, uh, training educators uh, as appropriate uh, to really be aware of kind of some of the signs and symptoms and then what kind of some of the actions are in response to kind of what we're seeing. Man, so clinical psychologists on staff. So we're not going to tiptoe around this thing. We're right. not going to go on right. the internet and go find this little worksheet. Like bringing in high level professionals to be intentional about this mental health. I, I love that. That's excellent. So and you guys are serving what? Probably over 10,000 so kids uh, mm. right now. Uh, about twelve thousand. About twelve thousand, man, and and I understand that about forty seven percent suffer from some type of anxiety, depression, mm. or, and even suicidal uh, wow. attempt. Like, what are some of the things that you've seen, you know, on, on those levels right there with the young people that you guys are serving? Well, certainly uh, on the heels of COVID, we see that uptick, as I mentioned, kind of with anxiety and depression, right? And, yeah. And just to, to kind of personalize this a little bit, I actually I have a 10-year-old mm-hmm. uh, who is mildly autistic. And um, a, a couple, I guess several months ago now, uh, he had been working uh, at home uh, mm-hmm. doing the, the virtual learning because he has asthma and a host of other issues. And uh, he calls me into his room one day and he's asked me with this the, the most, you know, sad, kind of morbid look on his face, like, Dad, why can't I see my friends anymore? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm. And and although he's not old enough to be able to articulate what he was saying, essentially what he was communicating is what we see thousands of students communicate yeah. is the the isolation, if you will, over the last year. Yep. Uh, the learning loss and just some of some of these things that we know exist in the education space uh, have really led to uh, an, a, a, an increase in depression, mm-hmm. uh, anxiety, PTSD for mm. students that are at home in, in less than stellar environments, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and all yeah. these things that are going on, and, and we see it every day. We hear from students directly. Uh, we do home visits. Uh, we go out and visit uh, parents and families in the communities. We hear from them. 
wow. all the signs and symptoms that, that our students are dealing with. And it, it's, it's incredibly tragic, uh, but I think built in that tragedy is a host of opportunity as well. Yeah. Or I think, um, you know, with organizations like ours, uh, the good work that folks at The Wire are doing and mm-hmm. several other organizations, uh, I think there's an opportunity to, to really mitigate some of these things that we're intentional about. Mm. Now, you mentioned your son. Um, just so that we can get some backstory, walk us through uh, what was it like? I mean, you're at 26 weeks in. Uh, I mean, yep. take us back to there and bring us up to speed on how you've had to deal with that personally, yourself as individual, yep. as well as uh, your son. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, to, to go back quite a way. So my son was a, was a preemie or is a preemie. I uh, was born at 26 weeks. And uh, so his mom and, I, and throughout the course of his life, he's you know struggled with asthma and, and several other issues. Yeah. So his mom and I made the incredibly difficult decision because I think we knew on the front end kind of what some of the ramifications may be of yep. a year plus uh, of him not being uh, in school. But it, it was it was best for his health. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and I think the, the piece of that equation that we necessarily didn't take into account uh, was that while we were protecting his physical health, obviously, uh, you know, what we were doing was also detrimental to his mental health. And there was right. nothing we could do about it. Right. Kind of an unavoidable mm-hmm. uh, circumstance. And what we tried to do is, you know, all the things that all the parents tried to do during the pandemic, right? Like socially distanced play dates, right? And all the other uh, the other creative things that, that emerged out of the pandemic. Um, but there's an impact, right? Like there, there are ramifications from that. And we see it with him uh, now with, we're in a situation where his anxiety uh, over that course was also exacerbated. Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, his mental health, uh, the, the, his friends, the ones that we would try to do all the FaceTimes and the Zooms yeah. and all you know, the things that, that everyone else tried to do. But but I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't a challenge. It remains a challenge. Yeah, right? his absolutely. Mom and I, um, you know, continue to try to navigate. And the question that I always ask myself is, you know, I, I have a couple of college degrees and I'm in this space. Mm. And if I'm struggling with it with a 10 year old son who has mm. incredible parents that yeah. always engage and understand this work, uh, what must that feel like for thousands of at risk students who right. have the same issues but don't necessarily have the support system at home to really be able to help them mitigate those issues? Right, 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 right. right. And so, how have you guys helped families? And I, you know, if you could go just a little bit deeper, because, you know, I, I think about that same thing, too, is that, um, you know, college degrees, both my wife and I, uh, you know, how we work with our kids. And I'm always amazed at, you know, the single parent who does the same thing yeah. that I do. Yep. And we got two and we two parent um, household. Uh, and, and you guys seeing this on a, on a regular basis. And uh, as we talk about and address mental health, uh, you know, right now, what are the deeper things that are going on that, that you're seeing that you all are doing? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, a couple of things, uh, in, in addition to really some of the mental health things that we've uh, alluded to that students struggled with on the heels of the pandemic, I think food insecurity is one. Yes. Right? Like we've seen yep. a ton of that. Yep. Uh, I think, you know, if you don't live in this space or don't interface with uh, with certain communities, you have no idea how many children live in the Dallas region that don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for so many students, the school space is not only a place to come and learn and you know academic enrichment and all those things but sometimes it's also a safe place it's the only place where students get uh, a real meal throughout the day yep right yep now you eliminate that uh, during covid and you have students at home now you have this increase in food insecurity mm. right housing insecurity where we have parents that have lost their their jobs uh due to the pandemic and couldn't afford rent mm-hmm. or whatever those things are and while cities and states did a good job of, of really uh putting moratoriums on some of those things uh it, it, it on the heels of that now, we still see that as a challenge. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're working with a ton of organizations from the food banks to um, you know organizations like the YMCA, mm-hmm. uh, just several organizations uh, to really compile these resources so that when a student does walk into one of our offices and says, you know, we're struggling, we don't have enough food at home, that's yeah. a phone call our site coordinator can make. Right. Pick up the phone and he or she can say, hey, we've got this partnership, we need to get some food over here, over to, you know, such and such as home. Yeah. Uh, because this is one of the challenges that they're having. And those are some of the things that I think, while mental health is, is certainly chief of these concerns, some of the other ancillary things that emanated from, from COVID that we don't discuss a lot as well, i.e. food insecurity, housing right. insecurity, um, you know, PTSD and some of these other things that emerged. Yeah, it, it, it's it's all interconnected. You know, you would you would like to think, let me just solve this one thing. None of the rest of it is going to play in, right? But 
That's so not how uh, any of this works. You know, we when we talk with folks um, about all different kinds of things in our podcast, inevitably it always creeps in how they are different either personally or professionally, their businesses, their organizations or whatever, post-pandemic. But we always like to, to kind of focus in on some of the bright spots. Like, I really do feel like there's a bright spot in just about everything. And even in this... I would say the bright spot is that now the conversations about mental health and some of those stigmas that are being erased and some of the transparency and the vulnerability of so many people in so many different kinds of industries and from your top, top leaders to your frontline staff, just really talking about mental health and mental wellness and giving it the attention that it deserves absolutely is an offshoot of yeah. the of the pandemic. Yeah. Hey, you know what's interesting? is so a, a couple of I guess four or five years ago um, I was living by myself I'm at home and I've been having several you know chest issues right mm. chest pains and all these things and I wake up one morning uh, about two o'clock in the morning uh, struggling to breathe uh, you know mm. chest pounding so at the time I'm living in Forney I drive myself three minutes down the street to the mm. emergency room and ended up spending the night there and they performed a battery of tests right? mm-hmm. I mean, everything from blood work to an EKG to you name it they performed it within that right. six hour stay and um and what it ended up being was I was having an anxiety attack wow Literally, nothing wrong with me right wow um, and, and I am a person that, you know, anyone who knows me knows I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly laid back and probably just based on personality, one of the last people you would expect uh, to struggle with something like that. But it happened, right? Mm. It continues to happen. And it's something that even personally I struggle and have to be very intentional about maintaining, um, you know, a, a certain um, headspace, so to speak, right. yeah. uh, for me day in and day out. And the only reason I say that is I am not by any stretch of the imagination, the only person who experiences or right. experiences like right. uh, But unfortunately, and I'll say this out loud, and, and sometimes it becomes like taboo, in certain communities, historically, we have not talked about those kinds of things. Absolutely. Right? We've been not leaned into those conversations, but uh, I think historically, you know, looking back over the last several years, now we're doing a better job of that. Mm-hmm. And I think to your point, you know, having these conversations and, and particularly having them with young people because, yes. you know, half a mental illness starts by age 14. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the visual we have of mentally ill sometimes is wow. the, you know, maybe it's the homeless guy on the street corner or, or someone who, you know, an adult, but it's in the classrooms. It's, uh-huh. it's the 10 year old boy who's, you know, trying to figure out how to navigate his social or the 12 year old young woman yeah. uh, who's trying to figure out, you know, boys and all these things. So uh, all that to say, you know, I, I, you're spot on in terms of it's, it's really important that we have this conversation, that we're explicit about uh, these things, because I think it sets the, the framework uh, for us to have start having those conversations at a younger age with young people and hopefully being able to get out in front of some of these challenges. Yeah, and it absolutely is giving them language and understanding. So I'm talking to my niece the other day who is every bit of six and she is so, she's such the diva. I don't know where she gets that from. So I, I don't know, but <laughs> I don't know where she gets that from. So I'm talking to her and I'm like, look, Brooklyn, we got to do this. We got to do this. You need to go do this. uh uh-uh. Auntie, you you gotta give me a minute right now. I, I am feeling overwhelmed. I said, you feeling what? I am feeling overwhelmed. I said, how do you even know what you feeling, Auntie? Just get. And I wanted the fuss, but I'm saying, well, look at here. This baby done told me that I'm overwhelming her. I I know when I was six. I didn't tell nobody I was overwhelmed. I probably was, but I didn't have the language for it. Well, you overwhelming me right now, Keith. Well, I would think that people who are around you. <laughs> Uh, six or thirty-six, would, you know, they probably can say that, so I can understand. I don't you know. really know what you're talking about. I don't really know. So but. we're talking to uh, Mr. Adam Powell, President and CEO of uh, for Communities and School for the Dallas Region, and we're talking about mental health. Mm. Um, October is um, has a litany of different awareness around uh, men- mental health, and uh, we want to make sure that we're bringing that to the attention of um, of everyone. This is a focus on uh, at the education part. There's a focus on depression part. Many national days that are uh, recognized uh, from National Depression and Mental Health Screening Month to Health Literacy Month, ADHD Awareness Month, several different things that we're celebrating um, or that we are exp- um, making people aware of throughout the month of Dallas. I mean, throughout the month of October. The I'm month not sure. Of Dallas. I know. I don't know where that one came I don't from. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but as we look at some of the data that is out there, you know, there's over 17 million children and adults in the United States who suffer from ADHD. Mm. Uh, and you guys are working with young people day in and day out. We do the same, um, you know, during the summertime for us kids at camp. You know, that's the time that parents want to remove the medicine. And mm-hmm. we're saying that, hey, mom and dad, at least make us aware of that so we can right. help support the process. We just talked about, uh, you know, certain communities that people don't want to talk about that. But, you know, hey, we want to be the support system, you know, to yep. be able to aid with that. So if you don't want to send the medicine, get, give us make us aware so that we can absolutely. understand the understand the process. What do you guys see with, uh, you know, with ADHD and the medication and in your programs that you all are, are working with young people? Well, you know, you mentioned the numbers, and we certainly see see the same thing anecdotally mm. on our campuses. Um, in, in fact, um, it is one of the most prevalent uh, mental health disorders that we see in, in the, the young people that we work with. My yeah. son, for example, again, going back to him, yeah. uh, is ADHD as well. And, and I think for us, it's really about systems of support. Right? Mm. It's, it's kind of the, the, the way we, we frame that. Uh, we obviously have the full-time site coordinator who's on the campus uh, working directly with them. And because of the relationship that our site coordinators have with students, it's, it's generally, they have access to a ton of information, you know, just from the relationship with students and families, et cetera. Um, and it's kind of that second tier support, if you will, is, is our clinical team uh, that works at our main office but gets deployed out to campus to support some of these things. And I think it's, it's really about individualizing the plan, right? Every student is different. And I know we like to create kind of these broad categories of ADHD or PTSD or whatever those things are. Yeah. Uh, but every, every student is different. And I think one of the things that I think makes our model incredibly unique is that we do put together individualized plans for every student that we serve. So if a yeah. student has ADHD uh, and maybe he or, he or she is on, you know, taking medication, uh, there's a plan for that. Like there's a plan that every day, this is the process we're gonna walk this student through. These are the groups that we're gonna have this student be a part of. Uh, these are the conversations we're gonna have with the student to help him or her uh, you know, overcome whatever that issue is, whether it's ADHD or, or something uh, something else. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, just in, in, ta- in, in the whole ADHD diagnosis and how educators and people who work in organizations like ours who are supporting these kids and families, just really, even in that, that ADHD, uh, diagnosis, taking the stigma off that, right? And not using okay. that to say kids aren't able to learn or they're not as smart or, or they can't do certain things. It's just that you have to think of different ways and more creative ways to help them channel and focus and be productive. Um, yep. And so um, I, I'm super excited about the work that you guys are doing, that you are standing up mental health professionals in your school settings, that you are taking this seriously. It's not just we're going to add a coloring page <laughs> right, right, right to some right. curriculum um, but that we are really going to center this mental health piece because when you drive down it really is at the center of all of the, the supports that you can offer a child um, in the after school setting or period I mean, and, and we've doubled yeah. down on that I mean, yeah. we've been very intentional and very uh, explicit uh, over the last several years about that we're in the midst now of a, of a $10 million fundraising campaign mm. the majority of which is to support uh, our work in the mental health space and mm. to continue you to build our, our our clinical team. Good, kudos. Awesome, man. That's yeah. excellent. Doing great work. Um, so as we close out, what is it? Well, I mean, what is the big statement that you would leave with folks who are listening? The folks that are listening to us are um, they're in the programming space around uh, youth development. Uh, what's the encouraging word that you would around mental health that you would leave with them? You know, I would say uh, on the heels of COVID, like there, there are a litany uh, of uh, educational challenges that we have. I mean, we're dealing with learning loss. Mm. Uh, you know, you're dealing with you know uh, uh, racial equity mm. right? uh, yeah. in the education space. I mean, we could we could go down this laundry list of things. Uh, I would submit to people that I don't think there is a greater challenge we have today uh, in the heels of COVID. Uh, in, in 2021 uh, than the mental health and wellness of our young people. Wow. Um, uh, interesting statistic. Uh, the, the second leading cause of death right now among young people ages 10 to 24 is suicide. Uh, wow. Second leading cause. Uh, right? Wow. So this is not about uh, necessarily, you know, helping students, uh, you know, be better academically or be better, better behaviorally. This is about their physical and mental Saving well-being. lives. Right? Yes. Come on. And I Come can't, on. The, the message I would leave and what I would press upon people is uh, among all the things that are going on, and, and, and there are, again, millions of things, hundreds of things at the very least, that uh, that need attention and need resources and need attention uh, being being um, 
granted to it, I would say there's none greater than the mental health and wellness of our young people. Mm, yeah, y'all incredible. take that. Focus, help, support, amplify, center the mental health of young people. You have said a word today, Mr. Yes, sir. Powell. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Super excited to have you here on the Peace of Mind episode of the Cosmetic Podcast. And thank you all for listening to Cosmetic. Hey, where we're tackling topics and telling the truth. Subscribe and listen to us weekly. Hey, and don't be shy. Give us a five-star review. Not four stars, five stars. And as always, be dynamic. Be phenomenal. Be cosmetic.